everyone, it's me Shanti and you are watching Biology Nowadays. In this video, we will see classification, general characteristics and economic uses of pteridophytes, the members of the third group coming under plant kingdom. If you look around, you may be able to see plants like this in your garden or sometimes on tree trunks. They belong to the group pteridophytes. Pteridophytes are a very old group of land plants. According to the fossil records, they have been on earth for at least 360 million years. They covered many parts of earth during the times of dinosaurs and continue to flourish even today. Pteridophytes range greatly in size. They range from tiny azola plants to huge tree ferns which reach up to a height of 25 meters. Like bryophytes, the pteridophytes also require water for fertilization to occur during sexual reproduction. The sperms produced in the male sex organs called antheridia swim through water to reach the egg cell in the archegonia. As they require water for fertilization, they are seen in moist, shady, cool and humid conditions, mostly in the tropical regions. But some members of the pteridophytes are also seen in temperate regions. You may be remembering that the main plant body in bryophytes is haploid and gametophyte, which produces gametes. But in the case of pteridophytes, the main plant body is diploid and sporophyte, which produces spores. In other words, diploid sporophytic phase is the dominant phase in the life cycle of pteridophytes. Actually, during the course of evolution in plants, the diploid sporophytic phase became dominant, whereas the haploid gametophytic phase got reduced. In this picture, you can see that in the lower plant groups like algae and bryophytes, the haploid gametophyte is the main plant body, while in pteridophytes and in higher plant groups like gymnosperms and angiosperms, the main plant body is diploid and sporophyte. In bryophytes, the sporophyte is attached and nutritionally dependent on gametophyte. But in pteridophytes, the gametophyte is reduced to a small structure called prothallus. At first, the young sporophyte remains attached to the gametophyte and receives nourishment from it. But the sporophyte grows rapidly and soon develops into an independent plant while the gametophyte dies off. Pteridophytes have well developed true roots, stems and leaves which means that they have vascular tissues called xylem and phloem. Xylem is specialized in transporting water and nutrients from roots to other plant parts while phloem is specialized in transporting food or in other words carbohydrates produced through photosynthesis from leaves to the growing as well as storage tissues of the plant body. The advent of the plant vascular system is one of the most important moments in the evolution of life on earth. Because of the vascular system, the water and food can be transported over more distances in the plant body, allowing plants to increase in size and more successfully invade land. Pteridophytes are called vascular plants because of the presence of vascular tissues. The plants belonging to gymnosperms and angiosperms are also vascular plants. But obviously, pteridophytes are the first vascular plants. As you already know, the groups algae and bryophytes don't have vascular tissues and so they are called non-vascular plants. Pteridophytes belong to four classes. Silopsida, Lycopsida, Spinopsida, and Pteropsida. Let's see the main characteristics and representative members of each class. First of all, the class Silopsida. The members belonging to the genus Silotum are examples. Silotum is unique among living vascular plants because it lacks both roots and leaves. 
Instead of true roots, sciotum have rhizoids. The main plant body or sporophyte produces haploid spores after meiosis division in sporangia. Sporangia are seen on the short lateral branches. The second class is Lycopsida. Members of genus Lycopodium, commonly called as club mosses, are examples for this class. But remember one thing, even though they are called club mosses, they are not related to the true mosses coming under bryophytes. The main plant body of Lycopodium, which is the sporophyte, consists of a branching rhizome. Rhizome is actually an underground stem which is horizontal and grows continuously. Rhizome gives rise to aerial lateral shoots and also numerous adventitious roots. The leaves are small. They are called microphylls, which means small leaves. Some microphylls are special because they bear sporangia. Such microphylls bearing sporangia are called sporophylls. In some lycopodium members, the sporophylls are grouped into a structure called strobilus at the tips of the aerial branches. The plural form of strobilus is strobili. In this picture, you can see four strobili. Members belonging to the genus Selaginella are also common examples of this class. The main plant body of Selaginella members looks very similar to that of lycopodium members. A main difference between Lycopodium and Salaginella is that Salaginella is heterosporous, which means that Salaginella produces two different kinds of spores called microspores and megaspores. If you take a closer look at the strobilus of Salaginella, then you can see two different kinds of sporangia in the same strobilus. There are microsporangia, which produce microspores and megasporangia which produces megaspores. Both microsporangia and megasporangia have different shapes. Sporophylls bearing microsporangia are called microsporophylls and sporophylls bearing megasporangia are called megasporophylls. Let's see the life cycle of Selaginella. We will start with the spores. The megaspore germinates into a female gametophyte which forms archegodium with egg. The development of female gametophyte starts while the megaspore is still inside the megasporangium. The megaspores are liberated from the megasporangium either at the time of first archegonium formation or just after fertilization. The microspores are released when they get mature and they germinate into male gametophytes which form andridia with sperms. The sperms swim through the water and reach the egg cell in the archegonium. The nuclei of both egg and the sperm fuse to form a zygote inside the archegonium of the female gametophyte. The zygote will develop into an embryo and then into a young sporophyte. The young sporophyte then grows rapidly to become an independent mature sporophyte which is the main plant body. The mature sporophyte forms strobilus with microsporangia and megasporangia. In the megasporangium, the megaspore mother cell undergoes meiosis division to form megaspores, while in the microsporangium, the microspore mother cell undergoes meiosis division to form microspores. Coming to the third class, Sphenopsida. Equisetum is a common example of this class. They are commonly called as host tails. The name host tail is given because the branch species of Equisetum somewhat resemble like host tail. Even the scientific name Equisetum is derived from the Latin word equus, meaning host, and seta, meaning bristle. In equisitum, the small leaves, that is the microphylls, are reduced to scale-like structures. The microphylls are fused and whirled at the nodes. Equisitum also has strobili at the apex of the stem. In the strobilus, 
there are many small umbrella like structures called sporangiophores. The sporangiophores bear sporangia. Sporangia are seen in groups of 5 to 10 along the margins of each sporangiophore. Like Psyllodium and Lycopodium, Equisetum is homosporous, which means that it produces only one type of spores. Now let's learn about the fourth class, Teropsida. Members belonging to the genus Dryopterus, Terus, and Yantum are some examples. The members of the class Teropsida are commonly called as ferns. I'm pretty sure that you will be very familiar to this group of pterodophytes, especially due to their typical look. But some members of pteropsida like Salvinia, Azola and tree ferns may not have that typical fern look. The stem of most ferns is a horizontally growing underground rhizome. Vegetative reproduction is by forming buds on rhizome and also by fragmentation of rhizome. The rhizome produces numerous adventitious roots. In adiantum, whenever a leaf surface touches the soil, it gives out adventitious roots and forms a new plantlet, creating a walking effect. Hence, it is called the walking fern. The leaves or fronds of ferns are big. So they are called megaphils, meaning big leaves. Mostly megaphils are pinnately compound. Another characteristic feature of ferns is that in most of the ferns the young leaves are coiled in the bud. This type of leaf development is known as circinate vernation. As you can see in this video, when the fern leaf is formed, it is tightly curled so that the tender growing tip of the leaf is protected within the coil. As the leaf grows, it unrolls from the tip. The coil young leaves of ferns are commonly referred to as fiddleheads. Fiddle is the colloquial term for violin. The coil leaf bud is called fiddlehead because it resembles the handle of a fiddle or violin. Most of the ferns are homospores, which means that they produce only one type of spores. Spores are produced in sporangia. In ferns, the sporangia are seen on the lower surface of the leaves. Sporangia are found as clusters. A single cluster of sporangia is called a sorus. There will be many sorus on the lower side of the leaf. Plural form of sorus is sori. If you have a closer look at the sorus, you can see many tiny ball-like structures. Actually, each of these tiny ball-like structure is a sporangium. And inside the sporangium, there are a lot of spores. As you know, haploid spores are produced in sporangia after meiosis division. Let's see the life cycle of a fern. We will start with the spores. The spore germinates into a gametophyte called prothallus. The gametophyte of most ferns has both sex organs. The male sex organs, Antheroidea, produce sperms and the female sex organs, Archegonia, produce egg. The sperms swim through water and reach the egg in the Archegonium. The nuclei of the sperm and the egg fuse to form zygote inside the Archegonium. The zygote develops into an embryo and then into a young sporophyte which will be still attached to the gametophyte. Soon, the young sporophyte grows rapidly into a mature sporophyte which is the main plant body and the gametophyte dies off. The mature sporophyte produces clusters of sporangia on the lower surface of the leaves. When the spores in each sporangium get mature, the sporangium breaks open the top half first bends backwards and then come forward with greater force resulting in a catapult-like discharge of the spores. Check out the link of this video in the description box below. We already saw different classes of pteridophytes. So let's have a short look at the general characteristics of pteridophytes. 
pteridophytes have true roots, stems and leaves. They are seen in moist, cool, shady and humid areas. The size of leaves in the pteridophytes varies considerably. Some members like Selaginella have leaves which are very small called microphylls whereas ferns have large leaves called megaphylls. Asexual reproduction is by spores. Some members of pteridophytes are homosporous, example, Xylotum and Lycopodium. But some like Selaginella and some ferns are heterosporous. The adoption of heterospory and the retention and germination of a single megaspore within megasporangium to form a female gametophyte as seen in the case of Selaginella and some heterosporous ferns led to the phenomenon of seed habit. And this phenomenon has taken its completion in gymnosperms and angiosperms by developing naked seeds and covered seeds, which we will see in the upcoming videos. Spores germinate into gametophyte called prothallus. Sexual reproduction is oogamous. Here, the big female gamete or egg is non-motile, while the smaller male gamete or sperm is motile. For fertilization to occur, water is necessary. The cycle formed by the fusion of male and female gametes develops into a young embryo which grows by mitosis division and form a sporophyte which is the main plant body. Pterodophytes show diplohaplontic life cycle as the diploid sporophytic phase is the dominant phase in the life cycle of pterodophytes. Finally, let's see the economic uses of pterodophytes. The tiny aquatic fern Azola is used as a biological fertilizer in rice fields. The cyanobacteria called Anabina azolae live in the leaf cavities of Azola. These bacteria in Azola have the ability to fix atmospheric nitrogen and make it available to other plants. And this ability has led to extensive use of Azola with water crops such as rice. Pteridophytes are used in the horticulture. Rumora adiantiformis is called the florist fern. Since the leaves of this fern will not dry that fast, they are used in the cut flower arrangements. Fiddleheads are used as vegetable because of their nutritional value. Fiddleheads are normally cooked before consumption. Having raw fiddleheads may cause food poisoning. Lycopodium powder consisting of the spores of lycopodium was used as a flash powder for earlier photography and also as fingerprint powder in forensic investigation. Now let me ask you a question. You may know that we humans have 46 number of chromosomes. But do you know which is the organism with the highest number of chromosomes? It's a pterodophyte, a fern called Ophioglossum reticulatum with 1440 number of chromosomes. From this fact, you might have also understood that there is no much relation between the chromosome number and the size of an organism. And that's all for this video. In the next video, we will see the group Gymnosperms. Thank you for being with me and stay tuned.